presentation on this about nine years ago for at the Collier County Museum for the Florida Archaeology Network. I've uncovered a little more information since then, but I'll be honest, there's a lot of conflicting information. I tried to sort through it and pick the most historically accurate, but I believe in the years to come that there'll be more information out there. And uh, I think it's an area of, that's overlooked here in Fort Myers. So let's get started. The Battle of Fort Myers, the southeasternmost battle of the Civil War. And that's a picture of the blockhouse on the left that was built during the Seminole Wars. And on the right, um, thankfully, a reconstruction of part of the actual fort during the Civil War time that was done by IMAG. I'm very grateful to them for allowing me to use this. The other part I want to mention is it called is said the southeastern most battle of the Civil War. Sometimes you'll see the southernmost battle. There's the Battle of Palmetto Ridge that takes place in May. I think it's 11th and 12th, so which they think is further south, some people would say, but the major um, troops, the army, armies of Northern Virginia had already surrendered, but it really doesn't matter. It's a later battle in the war. It's in south and pretty far south. So let's get going from here. Uh, this is one of the signs you'll see in downtown Fort Myers, and it says, in this vicinity, Calusa Indian villages were located in ancient times around the site in the Seminole Wars of 1841 and 1842. A fort was established, and it was named for Lieutenant John Harvey. Unfortunately for Lieutenant Harvey, the fort was reestablished in 1850, and it was renamed uh, named honoring Lieutenant Abram Myers. The Seminole War ended in 1858 during the war between the states, not the Civil War. Fort Myers was once more reactivated as a base to round up wild cattle to supply beef to federal gunboats patrolling the Gulf off of Sanibel. And this sign is from 1965, the date on it. So Fort Myers was one of the first forts built along the Caloosahatchee River. There was Fort Deneau in Henry County, Fort Thompson, where present day LaBelle is, and Fort Delaney, and you're gonna think I made a typo, which is actually quite possible. But uh, actually that was one of the spellings and the most common spelling of it. And that's where Punta Rasa is. They all came before Fort Myers. When a hurricane destroyed Fort Delaney in October of 1841, the military looked for a less a site less exposed to storms and further up the Caloosahatchee. Because of this, Fort Harvey was built on grounds that now make up a part of downtown Fort Myers. And it was a depot, so a place where storage, you know, they stored things uh, during the Second Seminole War. Renewed war against the Seminoles in 1850 caused the reoccupation and re extensive reconstruction of Fort Harvey. And uh, the military supply post was then renamed Fort Myers on Valentine's Day, 1850, in honor of Colonel Abram Myers, who was engaged to the daughter of Major General Twiggs, the commander of Fort Brooke. And Fort Brooke was up in the Tampa area, and there he is. David Twiggs, who will join the Confederacy briefly before his ill health forces him to resign. Here is Abram Myers. He will join the Confederacy as their quartermaster. And this is the young woman that he marries. Now there's 27 years difference in their ages, uh, but that didn't seem to be a concern for David Twiggs. And by the way, Abram Myers, he was never here in Fort Myers at all nor was his daughter. Um, I'm gonna go back to that for a second because I wanna tell you a little story. He becomes, um, Myers becomes quartermaster for the Confederacy, the head quartermaster, quartermaster general. And he is relieved of duty by the middle of the Civil War 
it was a really hard time for them to get supplies. You know, there was a shortage. Maybe he wasn't the most efficient. I'm not sure. And all those things, he was relieved of duty and he had, would have had to serve as a subordinate and he didn't want to do that. So he resigned. But what's interesting is the other thought is that the other story goes that Mrs. Twiggs um, had a rather sharp tongue, made an insulting remark about Farina Davis, uh, the wife of the president of the Confederacy, and that might have hastened his demise as quartermaster. And they will go on to have a son that has a great career in the military as well. So on to this. Uh, this is a map of Fort Myers, and that's during the Seminole Wars. I think it's about eight, I'm not sure, 1848, or maybe it's in the later 50s, 1850s, but it became the, Fort Myers is not a town, it's a fort, and it became the principal base for military operations into the Big Cypress Swamp during the Third Seminole War of 1855 to 1858. And I know that there are some people that uh, believe it's just one long war. The initial construction of the fort was delayed by a lack of building materials, but supplies sent from Pensacola resulted in a build, building boom that created a post with many permanent buildings. And you're probably wondering what this has to do with the Civil War, but this is gonna explain why there's a fort there that can be reactivated. The facilities included officers' quarters, administration office, a two and a half story hospital, warehouses for the storage of munitions and general supplies, a guardhouse, blacksmiths and carpenter shops, a kitchen, bakery, laundry, sutler stores, stables, and even a bowling alley. I would love to see what that looked like, a bathing pier and a pavilion. And it also boasted a 1,000 foot pier that enabled the soldiers to bring in supplies by a tram by 18. And if you look at this closely, uh, this is in Grismer's book, but if you look at it closely up in here, you can see where the bathing pier was off of the pavilion. And you're going to, and back then the water went much further. There's roads where there was water. There's, there's roads today where there was water then. By 1854, the post was considered one of the finest in Florida. This is interesting. And it was the subject of an investigation by Major J. McKinstry into reports of lavish facilities that included the bowling alley and the bathing pavilion. Remember, I told you it was down in that area. Here it is right there. I knew I would see it. Um, and it, there were 57 buildings in place by 1856. So what's interesting about, and at the end of the Third Seminole War in 1858, the fort was abandoned. But what's interesting about Major McKinstry is I looked him up and he was an, accused of doing things that weren't on the up and up. And he was the subject of some questionable behavior and got investigated. So it was a little ironic. I do think it sounds like it was a little lavish for the day, but we probably wouldn't have considered it that way. Oh, and I didn't even tell you, I'm, by, I'm in front of the hospital at the fort from the Civil War period. In 1863, a small Union force occupied Yusepa Island. And in December of 63 or January of 1864, it's in a number of sources and conflicting information. My best thought, guess is I probably it's more likely December 1863. Uh, and all wars have things where you're not quite clear, but the Battle of Fort Myers, not that I'm an expert, but in what I have studied about things to do with the Civil War, it seems to have a little more conflicting or lack of information. Union troops reoccupied Fort Myers as a base of operations for raid, raids into the interior. Uh, and this is a Union fort in the South and South Florida. Its purpose was to disrupt cattle, Confederate cattle supplies and to provide a refuge for the escaped enslaved, Confederate deserters and Union refugees and sympathizers. At the time, Fort Myers was the only Union base on the mainland of South Florida. There was a base in Key West, of course, and then in the uh, Fort Jefferson and the Dry Tortugas. And in response, the Confederate government established a military unit to defend the Florida cattle herds composed of South Florida residents known as the Cattle Guard. 
Battalion or Cow Cavalry. Uh, a couple of things that, uh, and this is an early drawing of Fort Myers, uh, but what I wanted to mention was uh, but even at that time, when, before it was reactivated, there were people hiding out, deserters or other people that didn't want to get involved in the war. And yes, there were some people that supported the Union. And of course, there were a lot that supported the Confederacy as well. And the Confederacy uh, couldn't defend most of the coastline. I talked about this before, so I didn't want to repeat it. So they were more into the center of the state because Florida has such a huge coastline, though they seem to be a little bit interested in our coastline of the river uh, in the South Confederacy as well. And those and the cattle from Fort Myers is, I mean, this area is going to prove very important to the Confederacy. And I'll talk about that in a minute. In 1863, Major, Daniel, Major General D.P. Woodbury, Daniel Woodbury was promoted commander of the district of Key West in the Tortugas. And he actually will die there of yellow fever, August 15, 1864. In December of 1863, he decided an inland base would be needed in South Florida to bring in union sympathizers, draft evaders, and as a haven for refugees. Another goal was to break up the Confederate cattle pipeline, assist the Union Navy with the Gulf Coast blockade because they were not just the river, but the um, Gulf of Mexico that was an area of interest for the Confederacy. And to attract small numbers of, the, of escaped enslaved in South Florida. Perhaps another goal was to demonstrate the futility of the Confederate cause by placing companies D and I of the second US colored troops from Key West to Fort Myers. They were the troops most often used on the cattle raid that were at the fort until it was abandoned. And you'll see, I've seen D and J. In fact, I think I have something here. Yeah, J and D, this is from the New York Times. Somebody who was actually with them during the battle. Um, so you'll see mistakes like that all the time. Uh, Woodbury strongly believed in the use of Confederate, I mean, US colored troops, excuse me. And the cattle I wanted to mention, that is gonna be very important to the uh, Confederacy because Vicksburg is fallen. They can't get cattle from that area. And they really want Florida to supply the cattle for the Confederacy. Uh, it didn't really have enough and of course, they tried to stop it and the Union's troops were kept on trying to take the cat, the cattle to, to disrupt the flow. But so Florida, though very sparsely populated, particularly in South Florida, um, and actually probably more cattle than people uh, will prove important to the Confederacy. Uh, and this picture actually, I just wanted to show you, it's a great cattle raid. This is actually from Virginia but to give you an idea of how important cattle were. While most of the larger engagements of Florida's civil wars took place in the northern half of the state, particularly the Battle of Olusti, 1864, which I had mentioned in my presentation about uh, the civil war in Florida a couple months ago, uh, South Florida became the scene of widespread military activity during the conflict's last year and a half. Much of this action surrounded Florida's valuable cattle trade, and the determination of each side to control the industry to its own benefit. Though occurring on a small scale, the events carried significant implications and repercussions. Well, who is this man? He's not even from Florida. His name is Charles Moonerland, and he was personally placed in command of the 1st Battalion Florida Special Cavalry by President of the Confederacy, Jefferson Davis. He was a former Georgia lawyer and a member of the Confederate Congress. And when he didn't get reelected, that's how he got this post. I'll be honest, many years ago when I first moved here, I thought that the Cal Cavalry was more spontaneous and a group of men just joining up, but it was actually sanctioned and developed by the Confederate government. When Munerlin was ordered to Florida, he collected and forded supplies, primarily cattle, to the Army of Virginia. The unit was authorized by the War Department on March 28, 1864, with authority granted to Moonerlin on July 7th to organize the battalion. 
the battalion Florida Special Cavalry became known as Munilin's Cattle Battalion. On December 13, 1864, Munilin was promoted to the rank of Lieutenant Colonel in the Provisional Army of the Confederate States. I'm probably saying it wrong. It's probably Munnerlin. Known as the Cow Cavalry, 1st Battalion of Florida, Special Cavalry. They were nine companies with approximately 900 men. And you're going to see a lot of these numbers. They vary slightly. You read 700, 800, 900. And that's true of most things that I'm going to talk about here. These men protected the cattle from federal raiders and rustlers. They also oversaw the cattle drives that supplied the Confederate Army as far north as Savannah and Charleston. Um, just so you know that uh, cow, cattlemen, this is what they, one of the names for them was Florida Cracker. Now there's disparaging names to do with Cracker, but the interpretation we're using here comes from the early Florida Cowboys and the Confederate Cow Cavalrymen. Instead of the rope used by Texas Cowboys, they wielded long braided leather bull whips 10 to 12 feet long, and when snapped over a cow's head, they made a sharp crack. Uh, the name Summerlin, I'm sure you know, all know Summerlin Road. The original cracker, Jacob Summerlin Jr., 1820 to 1893, Summerlin expanded his cattle herds so that by 1861, he had over 20,000 head of cattle with co commercial connections extending from the Caloosahatchee to Swanee. And the union desperately wanted him dead and sent out several raids to kill him and his floor and his friend, uh, F.A. Henry, Francis Henry, want him dead because they were such, um, they had such a large amount of cattle. In fact, there is a book about uh, a small paper, trade paperback about Jacob Summerlin I, that we sell in our gift store. And of course, Thomas Edison buys the land that was the original 13 acres here from his son, Samuel Summerlin. And this is Francis Woodbury, I mean, Francis Henry, excuse me, 1833 to 1917. And he was also a Florida cattle rancher, politician, and an officer in the Confederate States Army during the American Civil War. He was known by the nickname Barry. Henry spent the first three years of the war supplying cattle to the Confederate com Commissary Department, but his work was made difficult by a federal garrison that offered op occupied old Fort Meade, that's LaBelle, and that's where um, he's from, oh, excuse me, Fort Meade is Tampa. So in 1863, he organized his own cavalry company to keep the enemy isolated behind the walls of the fortress, and he's given the rank of captain and attached to Colonel Munner, you know, Munnerlin's cow cavalry. There's the hen, uh, there's Captain Henry, and here is his home in LaBelle that's still there today. Some of the deserters, evaders, and unionists who gradually came to the fort were first organized as the Florida Rangers. And to be honest, these might not be the most desirable people, but they were a person that was willing to fight some of them. In February of 1864, they became part of the second Florida Union Cavalry. Regular federal volunteer infantry companies from Key West also frequently garrisoned the fort. So people would come and go all the time and sometimes they would be detached and put there. Federal troops stationed at Fort Myers continued to raid cattle from the countryside. Some refugees that were at the fort who refused to be part of the Union Army, but they agreed they would assist in these cattle raids. It eventually numbered more than 750 men. But you can see there's going to be some problems with the makeup of the groups. There's going to be conflicts on how well they get along with each other and the other troops that will be stationed there. I'll talk about that just to give you a little foreshadowing. Ah, so I there's a lot of places in Fort Myers. This fort was pretty big, maybe close to 50 acres. Fort Myers was an active military post by the spring of 1864. Uh, a lot of the buildings uh, were able to be reused from the Seminole Wars, and that's why 
uh, we focused on the seminal words in the beginning because a lot of them just needed a little work done. Some maybe a little more, but they could reactivate the fort. It's an active military post by the spring of 1864. It consisted of a hospital, commissary building, barracks, bakehouse, wharf, two guard houses, all of which were surrounded by pickets, you know, people gardening it, and earthworks so that it was built up so it'd make it safe and people could be behind that if there was an attack on the fort. Many of the structures remain from the Seminole War days. The Wharf Hospital and officers' quarters line the bank of the river, which is not where you would see them right on top of the river today. Uh, the breastworks were seven feet high. Think about that, the earthworks, and 15 feet wide at the base. And the forts are roughly uh, 50 acres. So I, I just took some pictures. It's much bigger than this, but if downtown Fort Myers, First Street, and everybody has a slightly different view of where they think it, but just think about downtown River District today. Uh, Jackson and First Street. Um, I don't even remember what this one is. First Street and Jackson, I think. Uh, Bay, Bay and Jackson. And then the Burn. Sydney and Byrne Davis Art Center, which is approximately where the officers' quarters are. And if you're familiar with Fort Myers, there's a, a road beyond that, Bay Street, uh, before you get to the water. Uh, so you can see it went up much further at the time, but there is, except for a couple of signs, there is nothing, nothing left of the fort and encompasses Fowler at the time in the, when they're writing about it in the late 1940s, it went all the way Edison Bridge, perhaps the Clusahatchee Bridge, uh, Royal Palm Avenue. It was a big fort. And most people don't even know a fort was there because there is nothing left, nothing to show, nothing to, well, we'll talk about that in a minute. I'll go on. So this is supposed to be a picture of the, some of the second US colored troops. Uh, in 18 February of 1864, oh, let me back up. It's supposed to be. I could not successfully prove that this is the second US colored troops. I believe maybe it's the fourth US colored troops. Uh, there is a nice mural about the history of Fort Myers on the outside back of the courthouse area. And they use this picture to represent the companies of the US colored troops were here. Um, and my husband reminded me, uh, much better historian than me, that this was used in Ken Bird's Civil War series, and they hone in on one particular guy. But we will tell you that this represents the U.S. colored troops for sure, if it's not them. Well, in 1864, 900 soldiers arrive at Key West, because remember, the colored troops aren't activated till 1863. And then, of course, they are kept separate. They're not integrated, and they are always led by white officers they still weren't treated equally at that time. They arrived in Key West as replacements for the 47th Pennsylvania. The commander of Fort Myers at the time, Captain Crane of the 2nd Florida Cavalry, had requested the black troops to, strain, to strengthen the post defenses and to enhance his forces ability to disrupt South Florida cattle trade. And let me just also say that I think he wanted to curry favor with um, Woodbury, who was at Key West, who was a big supporter of the U.S. colored troops. Um, Crane, on the other hand, I think he did it for that reason. I don't think his actions and his words always appreciate them as much as perhaps he should. The actions at the fort with the arrival of companies D and I of the second U.S. colored troops in April of 1864 greatly increased Union actions in Southwest Florida. They often served along the Second Cavalry at Fort Meade, Fort Brooke, and Tampa Bay. The, those actions, such as the sacking of Fort Meade and the destruction of Confederate property, all convinced Confederate officials and sympathizers that Fort Myers and its troops must be destroyed. All U.S. colored troops, including those in Southwest Florida, counted freeing the slaves as one of their highest priorities. And there weren't a lot of plantations in Florida, but they were certainly some in the middle of the state. And of course, those people did not want their slaves freed, but it was a goal for the US colored troops. 
and a wonderful goal it was. The commander of Fort Myers observed the increasing tensions between the US colored troops. He's not gonna always be their commander, but at the time he is, this is uh, Captain Crane and the others at the fort. Now remember, lots of people, not even necessarily Union sympathizers, just people that wanted to desert the Confederate cause. All kinds of people have been hanging out there. They were families. They were people with strong prejudices. They were just all kinds of refugees. It was filled with deserters, draft evaders, Union sympathizers, and they all carried their own preconceived ideas about race. Fort Myers, a Union stronghold, attracted the escaped slaves, many of them who list, enlisted in the second US colored troops, which increased the tense situation because just because they're supporters of the Union doesn't mean that they're supporters of not having slaves. And they aren't used to working side by side with them. And I totally think that's unacceptable in case anybody was wondering about that. Captain Craig considered separating the black troops from contact with the locals in order to defuse the potentially explosive situation. According to Crane, and there's other things that you can look up, you can find his, uh, his comments, the ignorance of one and the sensitiveness of the other tends to make every duty unpleasant. I wasn't there, but do I think he blacked up, uh, backed up the US colored troops as much as he should? No. Were they perfect? Of course not. No troops are, we're all human. But I think there was a lot of prejudices and treatment, unfair treatment of the US colored troops, just from my reading and reading between the lines. The commander of the second US colored troops, remember this is a detachment of companies D and I, but this is what he says, Lieutenant Colonel John Wilder commented that the, men's, the men of companies D and I looked like the very bow idea of black soldiery. Wilder later commented that the second attained such proficiency and exactness in their drills that perhaps not a regiment in the service, regular or volunteer surpassed it. Uh, this was a hard picture to find. I wanted to find a close up of these troops, but again, sometimes there just weren't pictures of some of them. There is a picture of a certain company when they're older, but this is the 110th New York. And I believe this is them in Baltimore, yes. And so this is early in their career. And uh, this is the most current, the most appropriate thing I could find. So they are going to be coming to the fort too, and there will be a new commander. So after service in Louisiana, which being in the swamps, and I believe they were part of the Red River campaign, which is pretty grueling, they had seen some intense things. They went to Key West, Florida, February 1864, and garrison duty at Fort Jefferson until August of 1865. And by the way, I'm from New Hampshire, there's New Hampshire troops there, Dr. Samuel Mudd, who was um, sent to prison because he was believed he helped John Wilkes Booth, was also there. Eventually, by the way, he will be freed by helping people during a yellow fever outbreak. But it's a pretty significant place as well. Anyways, on attack on Fort Myers, Florida, February 20th, 1865. There was a detachment, most likely one company, and they were mustered out in August of 1865. And I pulled this from the National Park Service site with their information about the 110th New York. Um, I can't say exactly, but I believe it would probably be about one company. So probably somewhere between, depending on how depleted the companies were, 75 to 100 people, it could have been more, but they will have a new commander who comes from the 110th New York. The long planned attack on Fort Myers finally took place in February of 1865. In January, Colonel Munnerlin received a directive ordering the Cow Cavalry to destroy the Fort Myers post. It just was interrupting the cattle trade too much. It was having raids, it was um, 
helping to free escaped slaves, none of that sat well with them. At about the same time, James McKay Sr., these are all people that are part of the Cal Calvary, received orders to forward all beef captured since his was the only area left in Florida with accessible camp cattle. Under the command of Major William Footman, company commanders Henry, Leslie, and McKay Jr., a Confederate force of from anywhere from 200 to 400 men marched out of Tampa in early February. The attacking force was mainly composed of cavalry troops and men from Tampa Bay and the Peace River regions. They planned on catching the fort's troops off guard through a surprise attack late evening or early morning. And this number right here where I say 200 to 400, gosh, I've read so I've read scholarly articles and one of the quotes they say is 275, but later on you'll see it changed to 400. And I believe the New York Times, I, of course, 500. So I'm just hedging my bets. Could be, I think it's probably closer to 275 to, to some close to 400, but we can't be 100% sure. So remember, there's even conflicting information uh, there. And by the way, they're gonna talk about them marching and the New York Times said they marched 200 miles and people kind of scoff at that. And they said they came from present day LaBelle, perhaps 30 miles away. But before that, they started out from Tampa and then went from Tampa to LaBelle and from LaBelle to Fort Myers. So maybe not 200 miles, but maybe 150 to 160 if you add it all together. But of course it was broken up. So that's why you always need more than one source. And, and the New York Times, by the way, says 250. But even so with all the sources I get, there is conflicting information. And this is a uh, barracks of the soldiers at the fort, Fort Myers appeared vulnerable. Numerous men were detached. That's something that happened quite often, leaving primarily soldiers of the second US colored troops and the second Florida Cavalry to protect the post. So maybe most of the New York uh, people weren't there under its recently appointed commander, Captain James Doyle of the 110th New York Volunteers. And uh, by the way, this reading about him, maybe he was a slightly better fit than Captain Crane. I'm not sure I wasn't there, so that's just my biased opinion. Doyle had come to the fort from the prison fortress of Fort Jefferson at the Dry Tortugas. Additionally, the approximately 250 men at the fort, and that is an approximation, uh, were short on ammunition and weapons. The 180 men of companies D and I, and by the way, I say 180 men because supposedly they were 90 uh, of each, but other places I read say 75, um, but they only had, this I know, they didn't have enough weapons. They had only 75 usable muskets and fewer than 30 rounds apiece. And I'm gonna guess that they probably didn't have the cream of the crop and the weapons. The US uh, colored troop soldiers had also returned tired and hungry from lengthy skirmishes two days early. And that's the sign uh, by the library. It used to be out by the old library, way out. I mean, think of that was a little, even a little further away than the fort would have been, but it says the attack on Fort Myers in December, 1863, the army post of Fort Myers inactive since 1858 was reoccupied. The fort served as a supply depot. The federal blockade squadron troops from the fort often a raided Confederate supply uh, depots in the state's interior since Florida beef fed the Confederate army. I don't know if they fed the whole army, but they certainly contributed. To discourage these raids, Confederate Major William Footman led 275 men, again, that's questionable, of Florida's cow carefully from Fort Thompson, LaBelle, to the very gates of Fort Myers. Shortly after noon of February 20th, 1865, Major Footman approached the fort under a flag of troops and gave the Federals 20 minutes to surrender after Captain James Joyle, commander of the garrison, which consisted of the Union 2nd Florida Cavalry, the 110th New York Infantry, and the 2nd U.S. Colored Infantry refused. And remember, it's not the full infantry of any of those. The Confederates bombarded the fort with their field piece. 
they answered by they were answered by Fort Myers three cannons. Uh, I question uh, that. I'll talk about that in a minute. And the cannonade and musketry continued till after nightfall, when Footman and his Confederates withdrew under cover of darkness. Casualties on both sides were light. Well, whenever there's casualties, in my opinion, it's too many. But I. I understand uh, what they mean by that. And that's from 1982. So let me go back to this and say that they arrived at Fort Thompson, a deserted Seminole War outpost on the Caloosahatchee River between Fort Myers and Lake Okeechobee at present day LaBelle. Here they left their supply trains planning to approach and attack Fort Myers without warning for daylight. Lieutenant Francis C.M. Bogus recalled that on the night that it, their anticipated attack was to be made, it rained until the water was knee deep over the entire country. These conditions, probably supposed to say county, but these conditions slowed the Confederate advance. By morning, February 20th, the Southern Forest, still a few miles from Fort Myers, captured the federal outside pickets a corporal and three privates. Uh, sometimes it says four privates and no corporal from the second Florida US Cavalry at Billy Creek. So there they were taken by surprise. But let's see what happens. Footman's men approached the fort and met a laundry detail at a small pond frequented by the fort's inhabitants. Hoping to retain the elephant of surprise, Confederate forces swiftly fired up on the men killing a back private and capturing five enlisted troops and some grazing cattle. And even these numbers uh, kind of go back and forth a little bit, but you got a small number and one was killed. And you know, what's so sad is that we know nothing about this man, who he was, what happened. They have a family. That's why I always wanna know about any of them, who they were. They died serving their country. The fort now alerted to their presence, Captain Doyle reported we did, so that they didn't do themselves any favors by doing that because now everybody knows what's going on. We discovered the enemy approaching and the fort was instantly under arms and posted. Footman decided to demand the surrender of the fort. Instead of just firing on it, he's gonna demand the surrender. It's a pretty big fort and pretty strongly fortified. The Confederate commander later claimed that the presence of women and children in the garrison discouraged him from a direct attack, but of course he was um, criticized for doing that and not firing without demanding it. So under a flag of truce, according to the New York Times, that's where I, I read that part, uh, Footman's courier approached the fort and demanded a union surrender within the half an hour. And yes, some places it says 20 minutes. Uh, just, that just seems like such an unlikely scenario. I'm not, I'm really interested in why he did it. Maybe it was because of women and children, but as I said, there's later criticism of that. Captain Bar Bart Hoff of the second US Colored Troops who served as the intermediary between Footman and Doyle, commander of the fort, shouted out the union response, surrender when you make us. So Footman said, I'm gonna make it. So he opened fire with his 12 pound artillery piece at 1, 12, 1 10 p.m. Now remember I read to you from that sign and it said they were two artillery pieces, but most of the places that I've read uh, think that they only had one with them. And then the time of the battle, some places and the New York Times it says 12 hours, other places I've seen 11. It, it went on for a while, the 11 to 12 hour battle turned on the accurate power, firepower of the federal cannon. Uh, they had two brass six pounders and they were uh, very well manned by some of the men of the second US colored troops. There's also a line of skirmish in the bushes and trees on the south side, and this is according to the New York Times, of the fort manned by the refugee and deserted soldiers of company A and B of the second US cavalry. And the New York Times reporter wrote, the colored soldiers were in the thickest of the fight their impetuosity could hardly be restrained. They seemed totally unconscious of the danger regarding it and their constant try was to get at them. And by the way, this comes out in March, well into March. And of course, you know that the battle was in February. I was trying to think if there was anything 
else that I wanted to say about the New York Times article, but I guess not. Um, some things I think we can take, I guess this is what I wanna say, it's helpful, use a firsthand account, wrote it a month later, you don't know who he was, he didn't have a byline, I, I did pull some information out of it. Um, maybe there were some minor errors. Uh, you have to look at everything and just use your best judgment, which to most historically accurate and supported from several primary and secondary sources. Unfortunately, there's not always all of those. And this, uh, I just want to point out that this is a statue that's in Centennial Park, which is being worked on right now, so you can't access it, but this is done. Uh, by the sculptor Don Wilkins, and it is representing the second US colored troops that were here. And it, um, it's a fictional soldier that was made up, but it's a tribute to them. And right now you're not able to visit it, uh, but I do hope when it, Centennial Park's open back up, you can go say hi. I believe he called him Clayton. So the Confederates broke and retreated back to Fort Thompson LaBelle. Um, a Union Cavalry patrol that followed them found the trail littered with bloody bandages, according to the New York Times, splints and various bloodstained stretchers. There were maybe 20 to 40 Confederate casualties. And when I say casualties, I don't mean death, but wounded. And I really don't know how many of them died. And that's such a vague number. I'm sorry, I couldn't get more accurate information. And perhaps four Union losses. Some people say one death and, um, more casualties, and they, but all of them were members of the U.S. colored troops. The Confederates, this is really sad, to, to captured a number somewhere around five or six, I believe, of the black troops who were cattle and horse herdsmen working outside of the fort and some members of Company A and B, another of the second U.S. cavalry, another uh, handful of those. The Battle of Fort Myers was the final action in the US color of the, for the US colored troops in South Florida. Shortly after this action, the fort was decommissioned. Companies D and I joined with companies A, B, and K of the second US colored troops and departed for Cedar Key above Tampa in early March of 1865. The 99th US colored troops soon joined them at Cedar Key, uh, joined the second at Cedar Key. The combined units left for middle Florida playing a leading role in the Battle of Natural Bridge, which unfortunately was a Union defeat, but it's very near the end of the war. Um, and I, I think I read that second U.S. colored troops of the 16 uh, regiments that were here, they had the most action. Uh, I think the U.S. colored troops are highly unrecognized. Of course, we know about the 54th Massachusetts and the horror that they went through. But there are numerous uh, regiments and detachments that also served uh, very ably uh, the Union and helped free some slaves. Uh, following their service, the US colored troops of South Florida remained in the state until they received their orders to muster out like October of 1865. I just wanted to show you a few of these buildings uh, that the IMAC had that created for their 3D exhibit that they have. Uh, the IMAG with the Southwest Florida History Museum was combined into uh, the Imaginarian Science Center, and that's the name it goes under today. And you can go see a 3D representation of the fort, but here's some things, the block house, quartermaster store, the sentry, sentry box, the officers' quarters and adjutants' quarters and the settlers where they would get their goods. Uh, and the cow cavalry, I believe, is finally mustered out in June of 1865. Some of them uh, did not stay with the cow cavalry after that action in Fort Myers. It certainly didn't go the way they had anticipated. And of course, yeah. Army of Northern Virginia surrenders in April of 1865. Other armies surrender after that, but that was considered the major one. Um, and I'm very thankful for the to the IMAG for the use of these pictures. Um, so I encourage you to visit there. And of course, I encourage you to visit here because realize 
Thomas Edison comes here 20 years later. And what happens to these buildings like this? Well, the early settlers like Manuel Gonzalez used part of it to build their homes and everything was torn down. Um, and there's areas where some of the soldiers that would have served were buried and that was, um, a cemetery was supposedly removed and people were reinterred. Um, there was a military cemetery and I guess I heard from my supervisor, there was also a civilian cemetery. And now uh, more development is coming. If I, I don't, I live in Lee County, I don't live in Fort Myers, but I would love to see something that pays tribute to those who served inside that fort because they did an amazing job. This is some of my resources. I used the New York Times article. There's an opinion piece about Cal Calvary, a National Archives, uh, the Tampa Bay Historical.org, um, Erwin Solomon, on the Irvin Solomon on the attack of Fort Myers, significance of Fort Myers in the Civil War, Rodney Dillon, who wrote about the Battle of Fort Myers, Cal Calvary in Florida, um, and race and war in Florida. And uh, of course, race makes up a lot of this discussion as well. Uh, I'll, I, when I get through here, if there's any questions, I'll take them. Uh, just know that I guess you probably can tell that civil war is a great interest to me. I think it's, this is considered a skirmish by most people, but I think it's an interesting battle that deserves recognition. Um, it's a, a piece of Southwest Florida history, Fort Myers history, and the men that serve there deserve their due. And so next month, um, one of my favorite people talking about Edsel Ford, how Edsel Ford and Ford Motor Company helped win World War II, October 12th at 10.30. And you can go on our website, on the calendar and sign up for that. And does that sound like an exaggeration? Well, maybe, but honestly, I don't think it is. <laughs> if you ever um, wish to contact us, that's our address, 2350 McGregor Boulevard, Fort Myers, Florida, 33901. We've been through a hard time with a pandemic. If you're ever so inclined to make a donation, uh, that would be wonderful. Uh, for the time being, we're gonna keep on doing these digital discussions. I know everybody can't get here. And I thank you for my your patience with my uh, technology issues. Um, it probably doesn't look like it, but it does take hours of research. And I'm really passionate about history and I'm thankful for all of you that join me. These all get posted on YouTube. There's our playlist, not just the ones I've done, but the ones that Adam has done. And there's my emails, hshafer at edisonford.org if you have any questions or suggestions for a future. I would love to, um, have you do that. I'm going to stop my share so I can answer any questions or look at the chat. Just one minute. Okay. Let's see if there's anything here. Chat. Oh, uh, does anybody have any questions? You can send them on the chat. All right. If not, thank you for joining us. Tell your friends, check us out on YouTube. Uh, Oh, somebody said good work and thanks. And it filled in a lot of blanks for me on the history of Fort Myers. Yes, I want that 1865. I would love to see more recognition. Love, I'm passionate about a few things. This is one of them, baseball is another. But please um, just remember the people that got us started here in this area. Uh, and thank you, Maxine, for saying thanks. I learned a lot. Thanks, Dan, Janice, Dwayne, for uh, checking in. Uh, I'm going to close this out, and I will see you next month. Thank you for joining me. I don't believe there's any uh, questions or any more questions. Okay, thank you. And uh, check us out on YouTube. Bye bye. <laughs>